uh, welcome everyone to Jeep A Movie Club. This is our Christmas edition, and we have the most Christmassy topic, uh, Harry Potter. And we have a very, very special guest today, uh, Yana Raskas, who uh, did her BA, MA dissertations about Harry Potter and currently is a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. And her um, dissertation is again about Harry Potter. So. <laughs> Please, <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, and before we start, I just wanted to thank Jipo for inviting me and for organizing this. It's very great to have this cozy Christmassy talk. And also just thanks to everyone for joining us today. And as you all know, we'll be talking about the most famous wizard of our times. Um, we'll be talking today about Harry Potter from specifically a Christian point of view. And first of all, I just wanted to point out that uh, Harry Potter, of course, means a lot of material. It's seven books, it's a lot of storylines, it's a lot of different characters and so on and so forth. So I because it's such a huge amount of material, I did my best to kind of concentrate on very specific things so that we can squeeze it into 40 minutes or, you know, more or less and not end up talking for a week about this because we could talk for a week, but let's not get crazy. So the first thing um, I want to just start with is by saying that while Harry Potter is extremely popular today, unfortunately, the series are not as popular in academia. In fact, they have been very neglected by scholars and critics. And it's only recently that uh, there has been this kind of attention finally towards the series and people have started to consider the book seriously from an from an academic perspective. And uh, there are some issues with analysis. Sometimes it's too generalized. Sometimes people don't engage enough with the texts or they can forget um, a lot of moments and uh, plot kind of episodes and make errors, etc. But overall, there are some scholars that I think we should highlight in today's talk because they're relevant to our topic. And as you can see on the slide, the first one is uh, Dmitry Bukov, and he gave a fascinating lecture on Christianity in Harry Potter. The second one is John Killinger, and his approach is more general. He doesn't do a lot of close analysis with the text. However, I still recommend his works to anyone who might be interested in the topic. And the third one is, as you can see, is Emily Griesinger, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing her surname. So let's start. So, uh, of course, you know, we all love all the Harry Potter characters, but there are three figures that are particularly interesting today in relation to our topic, and that's Albus Dumbledore, Severus Snape, and Harry Potter. And the reason why they're extremely interesting is that they have a very complex relationship. It's, uh, there's a lot of conflict in there. There's a lot of negativity. There's also a lot of joy and love, of course. So it's very complicated and multi-layered and never one-sided. Uh, and they can be extremely different from one another with very different beliefs, etc., etc. However, they do have throughout this series this apparent kind of interconnection that is very significant between these three people. And what explains it is the Holy Trinity. And it's no coincidence, coincidence that at the end of the story, we uh, meet one of the kids of Harry, whose name is Albus Severus Potter. And he, this child is specifically emphasized from all Harry's children precisely because in that character, again, the connection between Albus Severus and Harry is underlined. So we get already the idea that there is a 
vital trio and from Christian perspective, as we will see, it is the Holy Trinity. And we will start this discussion by considering, of course, the first one, the uh, character of Albus Dumbledore as God the Father. Now, God in storytelling in general is usually analyzed uh, from four vital concepts, from these four approaches. And it is because these four concepts, they are usually associated with God in general by different scholars and thinkers throughout time, including such vital figures as Thomas Aquinas. And these four concepts, as you can see, is are omniscience, and omniscience is basically being an all-knowing being. Uh, omnipresence, which means that the being is not subject to the laws of time, first of all, but also kind of not subject to the laws of space either. And also there is omnipotence, which just means that he's uh, he or she, whatever, that the being is an kind of all powerful. And there is omnibenevolence, which basically means all good. And let's just start considering uh, how these aspects are portrayed in the character of Dumbledore and start with the first one, omniscience or all knowing. And uh, <laughs> this is uh, one of those cozy chats between Voldemort and Dumbledore. Um, when Voldemort uh, thinks that Dumbledore has no idea what Voldemort has been up to, and when he discovers that that's not true, he says, you are omniscient as ever Dumbledore. To which Dumbledore, in his kind of ironic fashion, responds with a joke, oh no, merely friendly with the local barman. Well, there's some truth in that joke, so let's kind of break it down and see to what extent Voldemort is right in saying that Dumbledore is omniscient. Uh, so we will break this down in kind of several steps. And the first one, as you can see, has to do with, with uh, three different concepts. So the first one is the pensive. It's Dumbledore's pensive, a device that he uses to kind of revisit uh, past memories, right? And uh, his own, but also somebody else's if he has them. And he can also show these memories and thoughts to other people. And most importantly, what we need to remember is that the pensive uh, only belongs to Dumbledore. Nobody else has this device in the story. And most importantly, it's used only by Dumbledore, Snape, and Harry. And it makes perfect sense because they are the Trinity. And what this device, this pensive highlights is Dumbledore's kind of ability to not only travel back in time to kind of revisit the past, but also the idea of him being able to um, kind of turn the substance of mind into a physical substance that he can manipulate as he pleases, which is really interesting. So this kind of idea of a being who controls memories and thoughts and time is already there. But the more even more fascinating episode is the one with the time turner. Now, we all remember that it happens in the uh, Prisoner of Azkaban when Harry and Hermione go back in time. And what we need to kind of pay attention to is that it is Dumbledore who tells them to go back in time. So it's he's kind of the grand orchestrator as always who doesn't necessarily do the actual doing but he always is the one to push you know that the first pusher concept of god in a sense so they go back in time and what is extremely important in that episode is that when harry and hermione are rescuing buckbeak the hippogriff and sirius black uh, we understand from the text, and it's also shown in the movie, that Dumbledore is aware what is happening because he distracts the ministry officials. He says, oh, my name is so long that I need a very long time to write it down. So let me just make sure that I'm doing this properly. And then when Bugbeak is rescued and he's suddenly gone, the ministry officials are shocked and outraged, but Dumbledore isn't. 
and he's just enjoying himself basically and you know and he says how extraordinary and rolling adds a note that says there was you know a note of amusement in his voice and that is vital because if Dumbledore didn't or didn't know or wasn't aware of what was happening he should have been as shocked as other people but he isn't which means that in that time he already knows the other times if it's it's a bit complicated the time travel process but he knows what has been done before it is being done so we have an idea of a being who is not subject to the laws of time and his all-knowingness is in that but also we begin to see his omnipresence he is not subject to the laws of time and space that kind of becomes apparent with that time turner episode in the third book or film and another point in this kind of similar omniscient discussion is the concept of the prophecy and what is extremely vital about the whole idea of prophecies in the story is that they are delivered only to three people uh, to Albus Dumbledore to Severus Snape and to Harry Potter again because they are the Trinity so it makes sense that only the Holy Trinity is allowed to kind of uh, know the future and permit it to see it or you know no details about what is going to happen before it does now of course it is Sybil Trelawney the character of Sybil Trelawney who actually delivers the prophecies but we need to keep in mind that she never has memory of doing so she's completely clueless and what is it becomes important is who actually hears the prophecy and does remember it and as we know it's first first of all it's Dumbledore uh, and I'm talking about the first prophecy, the prophecy about Voldemort and Harry. The first person to hear it is Dumbledore, then it's immediately Severus Snape. And then later on in the story, the prophecy is told by Dumbledore to Harry Potter. So again, kind of we have both kind of layers here. On one hand, we see how Dumbledore's omniscience and omnipresence is beginning to establish. But on the other hand, we can also start to see that uh, it's often when Dumbledore is doing something divine that can also be said in relation to Snape or Harry or both. And talking about uh, his, his kind of uh, omnipresent figure in more detail, right, that he's not subject to the laws of time and space, we should remember how he's first introduced in the very first book or movie. And let's just take a look at this quote. So we have his description when he first appears. He was tall, thin, and very old, judging by the silver of his hair and beard. He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak that swept the ground. His blue eyes were bright, light, sorry, light, bright, and sparkling behind the half moon spectacles. So it's extremely obvious that we're giving this kind of visual image of Dumbledore as the universe. So we get silver, purple, blue, bright, sparkling, half moon. It's not just, you know, an idea of, uh, a nice evening with a moon and starry sky, right? It's also a very kind of visual representation of the cosmos. So when he's introduced the very first time, we immediately get this concept of the universe kind of being put onto his physical description. So the idea that Dumbledore is himself the universe is already apparent. It's already planted as the story begins. So it's not that surprising that when the story develops further, we get more kind of this hints that he might be beyond time and space because he is time and space. He is universe because he is God and God is also his creation, right? But um, we can also approach Dumbledore's omnipresence through the idea of Phoenix. Now, Phoenix just kind of historically ha is a bird that has been used to represent resurrection. So there can be temptation to attribute Phoenix to Harry's character as he is Christ, as we will see. However, in our particular case, Phoenix is used specifically to illustrate Dumbledore's character. 
and we can see that uh, the phoenix bird is a kind of another manifestation of God, if you will. We will have one more and we will talk about that very soon. But it's kind of another physical embodiment, if you will, of a particular aspect of God. So and, and we we get uh, often these kind of uh, em that emphasis that they are one, specifically Dumbledore and Fox the Phoenix. So, for instance, in the Order of the Phoenix, uh, both in the film and the book, we have that very kind of impressive image of Dumbledore escaping with Phoenix when he grabs the tail and they become emerge in this kind of fiery flame, right? They physically become one substance. And then uh, let's take a look also at this quote that we have here, which unfortunately wasn't included in the films, but uh, it's in the Half-Blood Prince uh, book when we have Dumbledore's funeral. Bright white flames had erupted around Dumbledore's body and the table upon which it lay. Higher and higher they rose, obscuring the body. White smoke spiraled into the air and made strange shapes. Harry thought for one heart-stopping moment that he saw a phoenix fly joyfully into the blue, but next second the fire had vanished. So again, we have uh, that kind of uh, emphasis on the idea that the Phoenix and Dumbledore are one, right? But also we can see the uh, theme, the, the motive rather of resurrecting Phoenix here. The, the way it's described, it's almost as if Dumbledore is resurrecting. And of course, we don't get a new physical body of Dumbledore, right? But the idea that, you know, that, that line Phoenix fly joyfully into the blue is vital here because blue associates with sky, but it also associated, associates with Dumbledore's eyes. So it's a very clear kind of visual representation that Dumbledore in his death moment is being reborn. And although we don't get any physical Dumbledores, aside from one, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, not Albus's anyway, we understand that he is still present, that he is still there, you know, he, we just can't see him physically anymore, which makes perfect sense as again, God is the creation, therefore he's still all over the place in a sense. And speaking about other manifestations of God, and other Dumbledores, there is this uh, fascinating figure of Aberforth Dumbledore in the series, and also he does appear uh, in not only in the books but also in the films, right? And he is Albus's brother, and most importantly, uh, he does appear in the books prior to the Deathly Hallows on several occasions. However, Harry does not, he sees him on many occasions, but he never realizes that it's Albus's brother until Deathly Hallows, which can be strange unless we accept the idea that Dumbledore, Albus Dumbledore as God can choose when he reveals a manifestation of, his, of himself to somebody. So if we accept that idea, it does make sense that you know that Harry only recognizes Aberforth for what he is in Deathly Hallows when Albus is no longer present. But uh, let's take a look at this quote when Harry finally realizes who Aberforth is. Uh, it is highlighted that Aberforth's eyes were a piercing brilliant blue and Harry realizes that it was Aberforth's eye he has been seeing in the mirror piercing brilliant blue. If anybody has piercing blue eyes, eyes in the story, chances are they're related to Dumbledore somehow, metaphorically or literally. And the mirror that Harry is talking about here, it's the uh, broken piece that he keeps carrying around and he keeps seeing the bright blue eye in the mirror. And that is very important because in the Bible, we have a very specific quote that you can see here, which goes, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. And that's precisely what Aberforth does throughout the Deathly Hallows. He uses the mirror to kind of 
uh, see what is happening to Harry and help whenever he can, however he can. So that's kind of literally we have that biblical qu quote in that storyline through the mirror motive. And of course, uh, coincidentally, another thing that we can point out about the mirror concept is that mirror is, of course, a, a uh, reflection of oneself, right? So when Harry keeps seeing the eye of God in the mirror, it can also be looked at as Harry seeing himself because he is part of the Holy Trinity. And from that hopeful note, we will go a bit darker and scarier and consider uh, Dumbledore's omnipotence, which means all powerful, as we have said. So we definitely have, uh, we, we're all familiar rather with that character of Dumbledore who is very nice and he sings and he loves music and he eats candies as much as he can and he jokes a lot and he's just this cheerful old wise man who guides innocent children, which is absolutely charming. However, Dumbledore does also have another side to his character and that is where his darkness and his power come from. Let's take a look at that quote and kind of discuss it more. At that moment, Harry fully understood for the first time why people said that Dumbledore was the only wizard Voldemort had ever feared. The look upon Dumbledore's face was more terrible than Harry could have ever imagined. There was cold fury in every line of the ancient face. A sense of power radiated from Dumbledore as though he were giving off burning heat. So the visual is absolutely clear, right? There is power. There's this um, wrath, this anger, this rage that is also present in Dumbledore. And this idea of, uh, you know, God's wrath, it's also kind of very biblical. And we also begin to see this clash of Old Testament and New Testament in Dumbledore. You know, we have Dumbledore as the Old Testament God who can be angry and enraged and give off this burning heat, right? But on the other hand, as we just said, we also have Dumbledore who is kind and loving and supportive, etc. So we have those two contrasting sides to Dumbledore. And importantly, you know, Dumbledore, uh, when he um, when he uh, talks to Harry at the very end of the Deathly Hallows um, about his own power, he says that he was safer at Hogwarts, that the words that he uses. And what he means by that in that moment is that he was so dangerous for the world that he knew he should not pursue power, that he should stay, stay away from it and stay at Hogwarts to contain that. So he's fully aware of what he's capable capable of. And we get many other instances when that also happens. He uh, tells the ministry officials, for instance, at one point that he can battle them and win again. He also tells Fudge at one point that he can break out of Azkaban in, you know, just like that easily done. And that's a scary thought because in Azkaban, you are not allowed a wand. So this power that we're talking about, it's an all powerful God, which is slightly terrifying. And from that terrifying note, we can uh, switch back to a bit, you know, joy and hope uh, and talk about God uh, as, as an all loving being and, you know, Dumbledore's omnibenevolence. So, uh, we all know that in the story, the all goodness of God and the Trinity is, of course, depicted through love, which is a vital concept for the story, because love is what helps Harry to commit the ultimate self-sacrifice in the end, right? However, prior to Harry's kind of final understanding what he needs to do and why, he doesn't understand the idea of love being that powerful. So for instance, when he talks about uh, his power and the prophecy and love, he tells, uh, he asks Dumbledore, so when the prophecy says that I'll have power that the dark Lord knows not, it just means love. Yes, just love, said Dumbledore. 
And at that moment, Harry doesn't fully believe it. Like he doesn't understand that love can be more powerful than, than some curse that Voldemort is throwing at him, right? But he will come to understand it later. And Dumbledore throughout the series, he repeatedly reinforces this idea that love is the most powerful force there can be. Uh, and of course, uh, such false prophets as we will, we will get into that in a bit, but such figures as Voldemort cannot comprehend that. And for them, it's laughable. And for them, love is absolutely worthless. And so we have a quote from Voldemort who says, is it love again, said Voldemort, his snake's face jeering. So he's laughing at it. Dumbledore's favorite solution, love, which he claimed conquered death. And as we all know, by the end of the story, Dumbledore was right. Love does conquer death. And uh, we are now moving to maybe the most fascinating uh, kind of part of the Holy Tri Trinity. And what I, what I mean by that is that Severus Snape as the Holy Spirit, uh, he usually is not considered as such. I've seen a lot of material on the internet. I've seen a lot of academic material, of course, because I keep working on the series. And uh, there is a common misconception, unfortunately, to consider Severus Snape as Judah, as we are about to see. But that is not the case, and we will get into that in due course. But Harry, the same as my mother's, because he loved her for nearly all his life. So patronuses in the world of Harry Potter are, of course, extremely vital. And they have a very uh, kind of this spiritual idea about them so so therefore the idea of snape having the doe as he as his patronus that represents lily is extremely important so no matter how dark or kind of negative snape snape might appear on the surface and no matter his dark past in the end Overall, his character is ultimately built only on pure selfless love. And to add to that, we have the probably the most popular quote from the entire story of Harry Potter that everyone just loves, uh, which is when Dumbledore sees Snape's Patronus and he tears up and he turns to Snape and asks after all this time and Snape responds with his classic poker face, always. So, but we all love it nonetheless. And um, another kind of very interesting aspect of Snape as the Holy Spirit is uh, depicted in the Half-Blood Prince. And we get that both in the book and in the movie. So we all remember the story. Harry finds this book, it's an old potions book and he finds all these scribbles and notes and he knows that it belongs to a half-blood prince and he starts searching for the identity of that person. And most importantly, he believes that it's his father. So where they, when, excuse me, when Harry and his friends are talking about one of the spells, uh, Harry starts to think that it could be his dad. And so he says, my dad used this spell, said Harry. And then a wonderful possibility occurred to him. Could the half-blood prince possibly be Harry's father? And although at that point, Harry thinks it can be true because my dad was a pure blood, he thinks, but he drops that, he ignores it, and he continues this quest for a while to prove that it was indeed his dad because he wants it to be his father, right? And over the course of the story, the half-blood prince figure becomes almost Harry's friend, guide, mentor. He trusts this person. And in the end, this search for this fatherly friend leads to Severus Snape, which is extremely vital because the Holy Spirit, of course, has that within our story of Harry Potter, uh, and generally, it could be argued, has that fatherly quality, right? Because it was the Holy Spirit that blessed Virgin Mary to, with the child, with the miraculous child that would be the Christ. And we get the same idea here, kind of through symbolism and through different themes, right? Snape as the Holy Spirit blessing Virgin Mary, Lily Potter, 
with the child that will be Christ Harry. So it's not surprising to see these kind of ideas popping up here and there of Snape as the would-be father of Harry Potter. And now to the favorite point of this dilemma is that if Snape is the Holy Spirit, then where is Judah in the story? And the answer is that Judah is Peter Pettigrew. Now, um, for instance, Dmitry Buk, of whom we mentioned earlier in this talk, he uh, argues that Peter Pettigrew cannot be Judah. Uh, and he believes that it is absolutely Snape. And he says that Rowling is kind of depicting a justification for Judah's actions. However, that's not really the case because Judah's character requires some sort of betrayal. And in Snape's case, we don't get any betrayal whatsoever. Snape never betrays Dumbledore. The uh, death of Dumbledore was organized between Dumbledore and Snape beforehand. Snape is not happy to do it. Uh, but he has to, he keeps his promise and he does it. And as Dumbledore reminds him, you know, you're just helping me to die quickly and without pain, you're not doing anything terrible. So there's absolutely no betrayal there. And before that, with the prophecy about Harry and Voldemort, when Snape reveals it to uh, Voldemort, again, there's no betrayal there because although, of course, it was an awful thing to do and it's from that time when, uh, you know, from Snape's dark past, it's still not a betrayal because he didn't know what the prophecy specifically was referring to. And in fact, when he realized that it was the Potters and it was Lily he endangered, he did everything in his power to undo it and then dedicated his life to Lily and her son. So there's absolutely no betrayal in Snape's character. But where we do get betrayal is in Peter Pettigrew's who uh, was a very good friend of the Potters, uh, extremely close to James Potter and Lily, you know, they practically considered him part of the family. He saw young baby Harry before the tragic events unfolded. So he was very connected to them and they trusted him, everyone trusted him and he still betrayed them. So that already signals this kind of Judah betrayal. Uh, and then afterwards we also get in the Goblet of Fire, when Voldemort is telling Peter Pettigrew his plan to use Harry for his resurrection, Peter Pettigrew, there is a moment when he tries to talk Voldemort out of it. And he says, maybe we don't need Harry Potter for this. Maybe we can use somebody else. And Voldemort starts to suspect that Wormtail is trying to save Harry's life. So we get that duality of Judah. He cares, but he still betrays. And in the end, his life ends in a very kind of brutal, very Judah fashion indeed. And Rowling does not sympathize with him at all. The, the way he dies, it's, it's very negative and there is no you know, hope or peace of any sort. So let's take a look at this quote. The silver tool that Voldemort had given his most cowardly servant had turned upon its disarmed and useless owner. Pettigrew was being strangled before their eyes. So there's clearly that idea of a Judah-like suicide. And although the hand that is kind of killing Pettigrew is, or was rather created by Voldemort, I think it can be interpreted with kind of this perception that Rowling, she doesn't approve of betrayal. She tends to criticize it harshly. And so we should think of this as a kind of the evil hand. So the idea that it's Pettigrew's own fault that he, that he let things get to this point, but there's still that suicidal kind of concept definitely there. So he is clearly the Judah character of the story where Severus Snape is the Holy Spirit. And we get kind of uh, a couple of just parallels between, uh, you know, Harry, Snape and Dumbledore, in this case specifically, how Snape and Harry are both dissatisfied by God the Father, who never reveals his grand design to them and just uh, wants them to put their faith, faith in Dumbledore blindly. So we have uh, on the one side Snape saying to Dumbledore, you refuse to tell me everything, yet you expect that small service of me, snarled Snape, 
and real anger flared in the in the thin face now. You take a great deal for granted, Dumbledore. Perhaps I, sh I changed my mind. And then we have Harry talking about Dumbledore. Look what he asks from me, Hermione. Risk your life, Harry, and again and again, and don't expect me to explain everything. Just trust me blindly. Trust that I know what I'm doing. Trust me even through even though I don't trust you. Never the whole truth, never. So it's a very similar concept of the Holy Spirit, Snape and Christ, Harry, uh, being angry at God for not explaining, not telling, not trusting enough. So again, the, it underlines just that connection between the three of the characters and specifically between Harry and Snape. And then, of course, there's also the idea of self-loathing between all of the three characters. So, for instance, uh, we all know that uh, when Dumbledore first teamed up, so to speak, with Snape, he didn't exactly approve of Snape's character, who was still kind of more Death Eater-like than good selfless person. And so we have Dumbledore saying to Snape, you disgust me. On the other hand, similarly, we have Dumbledore saying to Harry, you cannot despise me more than I despise myself. And then we have Harry thinking, you know, the last quote that you can see, Harry felt sickened with himself. So these kind of ideas, they pop up here and there throughout the series. And what they're really doing is, again, underlying this, uh, this self-loathing uh, and this darkness between these three characters. Because although they're ultimately good, all three of them share uh, a dark past, all three of them are capable of dark deeds. And so this is just to illustrate that point, that connection once more. And of course, uh, most importantly, all of the three, uh, oh, I'm sorry, all of the kind of Holy Trinity is marked physically by evil, right? So Harry Potter is marked with the lightning scar that comes from the Horcrux. Dumbledore is marked in Half-Blood Prince when his uh, hand gets cursed from the Horcrux. Severus Snape is marked with the dark mark on his arm. So just as they're metaphorically marked by evil, the entire trinity, they're also physically marked by it. And from here, we are now moving on to uh, the son, Harry Potter, as the Christ, which is more or less an obvious uh, thing, I guess. But um, at least, you know, I've seen a lot of analysis on uh, kind of looking at Harry Potter as Christ. But what is never mentioned and what is never discussed that I came to realize as we're about to see is that uh, while he is definitely Christ, we don't get the first coming, we get the second coming. And let's just kind of break it down and see why that is so. So for instance, uh, we get a specific uh, kind of promises in the Bible of the second coming, and they are basically identical to what we get in the book. So, for example, when Harry arrives first on Privet Drive, it is highlighted that on his forehead there was a curiously shaped cut like a bolt of lightning, whereas in the Bible the, uh, it is said uh, that when the second coming happens, it will be like the lightning coming out of the east and shining even onto the west, so, sh so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And similarly, uh, you know, in the Bible, uh, it is said that the second coming, during the second coming, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And that is, again, precisely how Harry arrives in the story. A low rumbling sound had broken the silence. It swelled to a roar. Uh, as McGonagall and Dumbledore both look up at the sky. So visually and, and also textually, it's an exact almost replica, if you will, of the passages of the second coming from the Bible. And what we're looking at here is uh, the famous fish symbol of Christ. And of course, it has a very long history. It goes back all the way to the Roman Empire when uh, followers of Jesus were forced to communicate through the means of this symbol with one another because they were prohibited to talk 
about Christ and also, you know, and the reason why it's so associated with Christ is because often in the Bible, you can see Jesus eating fish, basically. So it became through time, this kind of one of the most popular symbols of Jesus in storytelling. And we, the only character that we get in Harry Potter series who physically transforms into a fish is of course, Harry himself, when in the Goblet of Fire, he becomes a fish and dives into the lake. So it's just one of those kind of very clear and loud examples that he is in fact Christ of the story. And uh, another thing that we get, which I think is very interesting in terms of Harry as Christ is that he is not just born magically as God, rather we get the idea that he becomes God. Uh, throughout the story as it develops. And so, for instance, at one point, we really get to see um, that uh, Harry struggles with the duality of his own nature. And so when he loses Sirius Black and he's going through a lot of pain, Dumbledore says to Harry, suffering like this proves that you're still a man. This pain is part of being human. And Harry yells at him in response, then I don't want to be human. And Harry observes that he had never felt more trapped inside his own head and body. So there's definitely that idea of suffering uh, and of this uh, kind of feeling of being trapped inside a weak human body, uh, right? But it takes Harry a while to understand that the love that Dumbledore always talks about, it's connected to that human suffering. That's how Harry can in the end perform self-sacrifice. He finally comprehends that what Dumbledore meant, this pain is a part of being human. And once Harry embraces that and stops fighting it, he feels the love that Dumbledore always talks about and he can finally give up his own life and triumph over death, of course. And we get a very vivid, both in the book and the film, the last film, we get a very vivid representation of the classic uh, Jesus Christ uh, death and subsequent resurrection, right? In the forest when Voldemort kills him. And then moments later, he comes back after he has a fascinating discussion in a spiritual limbo with Albus Dumbledore. And importantly, what Dumbledore says to Harry is that Harry's soul is finally his own. It is, not a bl it is not kind of marked by evil anymore. It is absolutely whole and he can choose to come back and to continue to fight and be with his loved ones, which Harry does do. And from this hopeful note, we will now switch to our favorite noseless villain, the Antichrist, who is represented in the series by Lord Voldemort, of course. And one of the most vivid examples of why Lord Voldemort is the Antichrist, it's his resurrection. So we have this twisted uh, reflection of Harry's resurrection, right? And Harry's rebirth, rebirth, it's extremely spiritual. But Voldemort's resurrection, it's very, uh, it's extremely material and it's all about the body, not the spirit. The chapter that uh, where it's described, it's called flesh, blood and bone, right? It's all about flesh. There is no peace, no hope, no spiritual anything of any kind. And let's take a look at this quote. For example, when uh, Voldemort resurrects, he's described whiter than a skull with white livid scarlet eyes and a nose that was as flat as snakes with slits for nostrils, Lord Voldemort had risen again. Well, it's a very sinister resurrection, if you ask me. But what is also very important is that, uh, of course, Voldemort has this concept of horcruxes, right? He has hidden his souls in different objects. And that is vital because the word horcrux basically means just etymologically or linguistically, it means a horrible cross. So it, it literally means the anti-cross because Voldemort is the anti-Christ of our story, right? It's not God versus the devil. In the Harry Potter books, it's Christ versus anti-Christ. And here, just kind of a couple of uh, parallels again between the biblical Antichrist and Lord Voldemort. So, for instance, uh, the Antichrist is said to deceive them that dwell on the earth 
whereas Voldemort tricks jinxes and blackmails in exactly similar fashion. Then again, the Antichrist of the Bible appears as lamb, but speaks as a dragon. And again, Tom Riddle, before he lost his nose, was a rather charming young boy, actually, you know, and everyone trusted him and they all loved him at school. And as Dumbledore says, he seemed polite, quiet and thirsty for knowledge. Nearly all were, sorry, nearly all were most favorable, favorably impressed by him except that he was a hissing snake inside. He's the dragon inside that appears as a lamb, as the Antichrist should. And the most kind of final vital point that we should also make is that the Antichrist of the Bible, uh, he marks everyone, uh, where, uh, he kind of leaves a dark mark on everyone in, on their right hand, or on their forehand and, uh, forehead. And in the Harry Potter uh, series, what we get is we get the Death Eaters who are marked on their arms, or we get Harry who is marked on his forehead from Voldemort's Horcrux and Curse. So it's another just kind of very visual, vivid, uh, strong parallel between the second coming, which necessarily involves the Antichrist and the Harry Potter series. And just kind of another point just before we finish this talk is that in contrast to, you know, Voldemort, Harry would never treat his followers as his servants. So Jesus uh, similarly in the Bible says to his disciples, you are my friends, I call you not service, servants. Whereas Voldemort's allies, they always compete in being his most loyal servant. The best example, I think, is Bellatrix Lestrange. It's her life mission to prove that she's the most loyal servant. But it's also, you know, a common trait among other Death Eaters as well, which is a complete contrast between, uh, to Harry as Christ. Whereas Christ says that greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. Basically, Harry could have said that line and we would all agree that it fits his character. And that's precisely what he does at the end. He triumphs over Antichrist through the power of love. And he gives up his love for his friends and for everyone who is being, you know, attacked and prosecuted. And he triumph triumphs in the end. And, uh, you know, just to round up when Christ triumphs, when I say Christ, I mean our Christ, Harry Potter, uh, we get this kind of final, very vivid picture that he is the spiritual leader. He is the prophet. He is Jesus of second coming when the war is won and everyone wants to touch Harry, basically. And they're all there to kind of almost worshiping him in a way. So we get this quote. Hundreds of people pressing in, all of them determined to touch the boy who lived, their leader and symbol, their savior and their guide. And I could have just used this quote to prove that Harry Potter is Christ, to be honest. It's extremely vivid and clear. But what I hope uh, I made also clear is that, you know, uh, contrary to popular belief, we don't get the first coming in the Harry Potter series, we get the second coming. And that's not uh, ever talked about in the academia. And I hope that maybe that will change in the near future. And uh, finally, let's just finish up with a rather cozy note. And remember how uh, Minerva McGonagall at the very beginning of the story, she said about Harry, He'll be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future. Well, I guess she was right and she is the wisest after all. And, you know, here we all are in the end. So Merry Christmas and uh, just a big thank you for joining and listening to this talk. <laughs>